Okay, hello everyone. Uh, this is Bowen from NIR. Uh, welcome to another episode of the iBoard session. Uh, and today it's uh, our honor to have uh, folks from uh, ZK Sync here. Uh, let me introduce you. Uh, we have uh, Martin and Stats from uh, uh, Matter Labs. And um, yeah, do you guys want to talk, uh, uh, just like briefly introduce yourself and, or like talk a few sentences about um, uh, what, what, what you guys are working on? Right, so we do the Z ZK, well, like we're, we're from MatterLabs, we're working on the ZK Sync, which is currently the top ZK proof L2. And during this whiteboard session, we'll explain to you a little bit more how it, what, what does it do, how it works, and all the cool things that are already there, and even better things that are coming very soon. Um. I think Martin has already uh, like said most of it. Uh, ZK Sync is an L2 scaling solution. So basically, our job is to make a system which has the same security properties as Ethereum, but uh, a lot cheaper and with better UX. Okay, uh, sounds good. Uh, I guess, yeah, since uh, early in whiteboard sessions, we do a very deep technical dives. So um, maybe it'd be good for. Um, like either one of you, maybe both of you, to uh, give us an overview on the technical level how the ZK Sync works, and then we will dive uh, deep into some specific topics. Sure. Like feel free to grab the marker. Yeah. Right. So basically, during this session, we're going to split it into roughly three pieces. So first, we're going to talk about what L2s actually are, how they differ from L1s like Nier, Solana. Second is we're going to talk about you know, how we utilize the zero knowledge proofs and how do we compare with other L2s that are depending on optimistic rollups. And at the end, we're gonna talk a little bit more about scalability, how they scale and how do we plan to scale it even more coming in the future. So yeah, let's uh, maybe quickly start off what is L2? How does it differ from L1? So the main goal of the L2 is you want to have something that can Slash mention can share the security from Ethereum. Like, uh, if you think about L1s, L1s are like independent islands. So, if you, if you imagine this is like Ethereum and this is another L1, like near, they are fully independent. If something bad happens to near, it won't. But if it did, it's, it's independent from, from Ethereum. They don't, they don't directly interact. The goal of the L2 here, like ZK Sync, means that even if something bad happens to it, the security is actually on the Ethereum layer. Which means, and we're gonna dive deeper into this in a second, but the idea being that even if something bad happens to the company, you can still recreate, you can still get your funds out. You can still recreate the state, even if there is malicious things going on now too. So practically it means that uh, on L1, we would have a smart contract to which, uh, which will store the root hash of the L2 state. And uh, the main job of an L2 is to, and the, its architecture in general, is to ensure that its state is always updated according to rules. That is, uh, typically L1, they need some consensus. They already need consensus for security to make sure that all the computations are valid. But in case of L2s, they're by design work correctly if if the underlying layer is correct. So that's the, the main promise and that's why building L2s is like a lot, uh, sometimes maybe a lot easier than L1s because uh, consensus would be needed for censorship resistance, but uh, for security itself, you can get it right out of the box. Yeah, so I think um, uh, you guys mentioned this uh, very interesting part, which is this uh, kind of uh, interaction with L1, right? I think this, uh, maybe we can dive deeper into what the smart contract does and, and how it's um, kind of uh, maybe the full like life cycle of um, interaction um, between like L1 and L2. Maybe let's, yeah, maybe let's start with like describing a bit about what that smart contract looks like, right? Is it, is it just like, um, is there anything special to it compared to like other smart contract on, on ease? Sure. So the way, if, if you zoom in into this picture, we basically, if we imagine this is the Ethereum, and this is our smart contract in there. So the important features a smart contract needs to have is 
on one side, it should verify. It should verify that things that are happening on L2 are actually legit. And later we're gonna talk about the difference between like optimistic verification versus ZK sync, but the TLDR is like this contract, if something goes wrong, this contract should react. The second thing is for the whole state recovery. L2 is an L2, at least to the full L2, it's a, it's a roll up, if you can really recover the state based only on L1 data. So this contract is somehow keeping all the, you know, all the necessary states, all the state deltas, whatnot, inside. And last but not least, this contract is actually also keeping the value. Mm -hmm. When you think about if that exists on L2, from the L1 perspective, it's hidden inside this contract. Yeah, yeah. I think the, uh, the, the maybe, I think that the first two parts are probably like, has a lot of stuff underneath that we can like, have like a, a multiple hours of conversation just about them. But maybe let's start with something simple, like how, how does the, uh, like the value part work, right? Let's say um, I'm a user, I store like some USDT or USDC on uh, the sync. how is that actually uh, reflected on, on L1? Yeah, so on L1, um, uh, okay, so right now I'll talk about the first version of ZK sync because it was like a bit simpler, but the second version is, uh, Slightly more complex, but okay. not, not that much. Okay, so there it worked like that. Uh, users, well, here's a contract on, on Ethereum. User, there is a function for depositing. And now when users deposit uh, some funds, they transfer them to this contract, basically. And then uh, there is, well, there would be like a certain, we can say queue of operations, which coming from L1 to L2, then this deposit, it gets appended to this queue. And uh, then whenever the operator of the NL2, when it tries to push a new block, create a new block, it sends his transaction here. And it, uh, besides some various other data about transaction, it also says, okay, I processed some, like for instance, three deposits. Mm -hmm. And then uh, through, and then uh, like these deposits they just get popped out of queue and if the verify process is secure, as Martin said, it, it is achieved by different ways in different rollups, but uh, since verify uh, process is secure, we can be sure that if this guy indeed processed three deposits, then it was also uh, reflected in the state route, which was published here. Like, yeah, so like when the block is proposed, also the new state route is published as well. So now we know that this state route fell too, reflects that certain addresses for which the deposit was done now contain the balances. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, when you say deposit here, does it mean like, um, does it work for any like ERC-20 token or like is there some like restriction? Uh, for any ERC-20 token, it's just that uh, in the first version, we uh, only supported, we can call it simple ERC-20 tokens in the sense that uh, if you deposit X tokens, you can only get X tokens back. So there is no room oh, for like tokens which you can deposit and this time you retrieve like two X. With, yeah, in the second version of ZKSync, whenever a deposit is done, it's actually being done like as a call to L2 contract. And then, yes, and then this, and in the second version, this L2 contract could, for instance, uh, like withdraw some larger amounts, but if it implements it on its own, yeah. I see, I see. And then for ETH itself, you need to wrap it first and then like... Yeah, yeah, for, for ETH, it, it's basically maintained in this contract. And on L2, it says that, okay, now this balance has a certain amount of ETH. Yeah. I see, I see. Um, and how does... And, and, and so basically from the L1 point of view, the contract is holding all that balance, right? Yeah, yeah, so from L1 point of view, this is just a simple contract. Okay. Yeah, it's just, you know, whenever users uh, interact with it, right. just normal interaction layer one. Right. And whenever a new block is pushed to L2, it's just a, again, normal interaction with this contract just done by a different user called operator, which mm -hmm. operates the blockchain. And then like internally, the, uh, the user balances are kept in the L2 state. Yeah, so like, yeah, all the balances, like their plain text, it's, just, it's only kept in L2, right? And the, the L2 state is essentially the, yeah, maybe we'll just briefly touch on the uh, slightly more complex topic, or maybe much more complex topic of state. Um, the, my understanding is that L2 state is, has to be fully compatible with L1 
state in the sense that you need to use the same state structure and so that you can, oh, it doesn't have to be, okay. No, it doesn't have to be. Like the way, the way to think about it is like, so yeah, we can talk about the state part. Yeah. So there are two cases that we need for state. So the first, the important thing is you need to be able to reconstruct mm -hmm. the full state right, right. of L2 based on L1. Mm -hmm. So this is one, and the second is state is also used for verification. So the way this stuff is being pushed is, we do push, let's call it like a state root yep. of, of a Merkle tree, whatnot. But whether it's a Merkle tree or a Merkle tree or something else, mm -hmm. it kind of depends on, on, the, on the contract itself. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. this doesn't it's get... It's like a, as long as L1, you can, there is a way to verify in smart contract that there'll be... Yes. There'll be yes. Okay. Okay. And then roughly there are two approaches of what you can do, mm -hmm. what you can put inside the state. So some people, I mean, so, some... Uh, companies are putting the, all the inputs of the transactions. So if you imagine the transaction coming into L2, they just put all the inputs. Yep. In our case, in case of ZK Sync, we are putting actually the outputs, yeah, putting the state yeah, diffs yeah. of this, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I think that's a very interesting part. Maybe we'll dive uh, deeper into that after. But like, um, just talking about the state itself, like um, you said, like, yeah, it uh, doesn't really matter what format you have as long as you can like, do like, uh, state proofs and so on. So like, what does uh, ZK Sync use today for uh, the state? Uh, our current state is uh, basically a Merkle tree okay. uh, for which firstly we have a few uh, shards which is reserved for uh, like some possible features in the future okay. like uh, Ziki port. I'm not sure if, if you'll have enough time to discuss it but it, we uh, do talk about it sometime. Okay. Uh, and okay so the currently used shard like so firstly there are I think eight well, Eight bits, like eight, eight, eight layers. Then the only use chart is the roll-up one, and uh, then we have like two hundred and fifty-six bit three. Mm -hmm. Like uh, so, what one key means? It means just uh, that for if some address under some key was mm -hmm. written, then the, the key in this Merkle tree it would be hash from address and key. And to add to the point of uh, Martian that the state does not need to correspond to Ethereum, mm -hmm. on Ethereum, all the state and you know, the, the mainly used hash function is Kachak, yeah, and uh, where, everywhere in state Kachak is used. But in our case, we use a more ZK friendly function, oh, Blake. No, Blake, we use right. Blake. Okay. Yeah, we use Blake. And uh, yeah, that's one of the examples. So basically, on layer one, we just store this Merkle root. And with each verify step, we prove that, okay, like, after this block has happened, we transferred, we correctly transitioned from this Merkle root to some other one. I see, I see. And is this a uh, particular trial or is this no. like regular? No, so it's actually the interesting part. It's, it has a fixed depth. Oh, so it's like a... It's always the, the deep. This is partially because of the, of the zero knowledge proving. This makes it far easier to do the zero knowledge proofs. It has a, oh, and then what is the, the depth? 256. Oh, 200, oh, the depth oh, is 200. Oh, yeah. Okay, okay. I saw the width is 256, but then what is the... Oh, no, no, it's, it's, it's depth. Yeah, okay, sorry, okay. sorry, I meant like... Okay, okay. Yeah, that, yeah. And then what, what's, the, what's the width on the, like on each level? Uh, it's a sparse Merkle tree. Oh, it's so, a sparse Merkle tree. Yeah, okay, okay. so it's just width as, as needed. I see, I see, I see. Okay, okay. Um, that's, that's quite interesting. Um, yeah, I think that's maybe the question for now about state. Um, yeah, should we talk about this, um, the, what the kissing is doing differently from other people by, um, I guess this is relates to the data availability um, of, um, of, of L2s, right? I think the kissing is putting state diffs on L1 versus um, I believe most other L2s are doing the transactions themselves. Oh, tra inputs, yeah. yes, transaction inputs. Yeah, so this is actually the, the interesting part because you could not put state diffs if you're using the optimistic verification. Right. So this kind of forces us to talk about the ZK right. in ZK yeah, sync. Yeah, yeah. So roughly when you think about how does the contract on L1 verify that the L2 did the right job? So there are two main approaches, right? It can be optimistic, which is basically what's called fraud proofs, or it can be ZK. The thing is the idea of the optimistic is like, okay, the L2 is doing their job, and then it gives people an amount of time to submit the fraud proof, basically to, to submit the challenge, right? To, and if no one submits the challenge for a given time, in case of 
arbitrum or optimism, we're talking like seven days or something like this, then we consider that the whole thing was successful. Yep. Now, in case of ZK, we actually, and we're gonna go far deeper into this, we, we actually do the zero knowledge proof of the execution. So now, if you think about the, the statives, having statives for optimistic would not work. Yeah. Because you need, in order to create a fraud proof, you need to have inputs for the transaction. You need to rerun the transactions yourself and then say something went wrong. Yeah. In case of ZK, you actually have a choice. You can do either. You can do either inputs or statives, up to you. Mm -hmm. But uh, in most of the scenarios, not all, but most of the scenarios, the, the statives will be smaller. Okay. Of course, there are some use cases where you can say like, okay, the, the call data, the inputs to transactions are tiny, but then it changes a lot of yep. state. Yep. But again, you know, in most cases, this will be smaller. And the other very cool thing about state diffs is if, we'd, if you do multiple transactions, mm -hmm. right, let's say next to each other, that kind of get batched before pulling to one, if you modify the same slot multiple times, mm -hmm. we charge you only once because we have to write it to L1 only once. So this allows a very nice compression. Mm -hmm. And in theory, if we, let's say, batch you know, one hour yeah. worth of transactions, I'm exaggerating here, of course, we don't do it. But like, hypothetically, if we did like one hour, then all the rights, let's say all the DeFi swaps, all the like, mm -hmm. things happening to the same cells, the same slots, would get nicely compressed, and this would drastically lower the cost of the L1. Actually, speaking of compression, like, do you just write that data verbatim to, uh, to uh, call data or like you actually compress the state if, like using some, some kind of compression? Right now, we just write it. Okay. Uh, so there are like, we actually use a small compression even now. Okay. So like in the most naive version, we could just write key and value. Where key is the key in this Merkle tree, and the value is just 256 bit value. Mm -hmm. But uh, we use the following thing is that if a key, which is 32 byte, has been published once, then we remember its ID. We kind of like say, okay, now we assign this some incremental ID. Mm -hmm. like, and then uh, if it's modified again in the future, uh -huh. instead of publishing the whole 32 bytes, we just yes, publish yes. Uh, ID right. and value. And we just say, and this one is eight bytes. So whenever an account transfers for the first time, the, his nodes, balances, etc., they need to be initialized. We, we can call it initialized in the sense that their keys should be published. And that's why it costs slightly higher than whenever they transfer afterwards. Yeah. But this is within one block, right? Or is this? No, no, no. This oh, uh, oh. ID it could be reused uh, for future blocks. Oh, oh, okay, okay, okay. So it's for like all future blocks. Yeah, for all the future so blocks. So essentially you need to keep this in the state somehow. Or... Yeah, so actually our key is not just uh, value, but it's actually a pair of value and ID. Ah. And uh, for each block, yes. we know which, what is like the maximal ID which was used. Mm. And then, uh, we assign just ID to new initial rights. We call such rights initial uh, in the order of appearance of the key. Sorry. I see, I see. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, and uh, you asked about within the batch. Within the batch, mm -hmm. we don't even need to use like any additional compression because if there are a lot of updates to one slot within one batch, we just publish one key and value. Yeah, that's it. Right, because this actually brings an important point that we didn't mention is that in case of L2, we actually generate, if you imagine multiple transactions are being put together, mm -hmm. then we create a one, what we call L1 batch. Mm -hmm. yep. And this is kind of what we prove, and this is what we actually put on Ethereum. Mm -hmm. So the proofs are per whole batch, right? We don't do like proofs for every single transaction. Right, right, yeah, 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 that makes sense. And to add about compression, we do plan in the future to uh, have even better one, but that is what we have done. Yeah, like uh, roughly how large is the size of the uh, state diff for every block? State diff for every block? I would say we, uh, how we run right now is that we have typically have batches as large as possible. Okay. So we can just say, you know, like 100 kilobytes, okay. but that's not some, you know, like limit of ZK sync. It's mainly just a limit of the call data size of okay. Ethereum. So we just run until we reach the possible oh. limit of the batch size, and then we publish the batch. Yeah. And then I assume we should uh, be able to put yeah. the next stuff. Yes. So dunk sharding should drastically allow us to lower the cost of, of the publishing, of the pub data. 
Okay, okay. Um, yeah, actually one, uh, one question, uh, just like I was thinking about this um, uh, stative approaches uh, when Martin was talking about it. Like, um, like how does, if someone wants to say like, um, I want to prove that um, this specific transaction happened on uh, ZK Sync, is there a way to, to do that? I understand the state is like, yeah, you, you, like, people can reconstruct the state and so on, but like, if someone wants to say like, I want to you know, prove like this transaction, a specific transaction has happened in the past. Right now, the short answer is no. So we are like uh, thinking about it. Like maybe maybe we'll allow it in the future, but uh, like uh, right now, it's not possible. Okay. So yeah, uh, the main security property of a rollup is that even if the operator goes down, it was yeah. like completely malicious and responsive. Users can become new operators. They basically can you know like continue the state. Uh, and uh, be able to process new blocks so right, that right, right. users can withdraw their funds. For that, only state is needed. Right, right. Yeah, no, so, I uh, yeah, 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 yeah. But, yeah, but I, I think I'm thinking about a uh, an extremely uh, malicious corner case, which is, let's say, or like maybe not malicious, but yeah. like some faulty corner case, which is, uh, let's say, like um, ZK Sync's uh, sequencer has some bug, and also the, the prover has some bug as well. So, like, you essentially in accidentally did a invalid state or like incorrect state transition and the state diff is posted and then the proof happens to not like happens to prove that um, maybe because it is under constraint or something like happens to be able to check out then like yes if like let's say uh, MetaLabs disappears yes people can like re like recover the state and so on but like they would not be able to identify that some state transition in the past was incorrect yes uh, what's worse is like yeah they it's not only that you cannot see if a given transaction is there. You, can, you don't even know how many transactions. Yes, you don't know. Right? Yes. So like you have, in theory, if you just observe L1, you see magic. You right, see his right. proofs and then just yeah, yeah, yeah. random state changes, right? So, yeah, yeah, but, but so basically that, like, it's relying on the fact that, or relying on the assumption that proofs are, should be correct. Like they, <laughs> they better be. They better be, otherwise. No, no but, but like, if, if, let's say, like, uh, if you actually store the transaction data, then like, even if the, well, it's still very bad if the proofs are not correct. But at least you can. There is a way for like independent party to just like rerun the whole history and like. No, but I mean, you, you said that if the proofs are incorrect, if the proofs are incorrect, then uh, after all these transactions, even like if you don't publish stages, but you know, like pure transactions, mm -hmm. even after all of them like has been published. The state which is stored here mm -hmm. could be changed to incorrect one, be, 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 because how it works is that the operator basically sends the state changes and mm -hmm. then the proof, and uh, the only difference with transactions is that they would say just transactions and the proof, and so if proof is uh, validated on layer one, right, the state right. transition will be done. So it, it, yes, they would be able to in theory rerun them, yeah. but. Uh, yeah, maybe, no, I maybe even yeah, not. Yeah, maybe yeah. even not. Maybe he'll be able to just publish some garbage transactions. You know, if is the proof incorrect. So. Sure, sure. Yeah. No, I think yeah, this is a kind of corner case. At, uh, no, and, and to be fair, this is actually one of the big challenges when you when you explain people like how optimistic rollups and fraud proofs work. Yeah. it's kind of natural. Right. You'd be like, yes, and I can rerun it if something is wrong. I can be like, hey, this is wrong, and right. it gets reverted. Start talking about the zk proof. It's yeah. really the first time. And the second and the third and the fourth time you read it, it looks like magic. Yeah, yeah, You're yeah. like, how? how? <laughs> yeah, okay, let's talk about the magic. Um, maybe let's erase some of, some of this stuff. Um, oh. okay. So yeah, I guess um, let's maybe talk a bit about how the, um, like the VM or like the leaky part actually works. Right, okay. So, uh, Couple important things, and here we'll also be talking not only about the ZK thing, but also a bunch of other about about a bunch of other L2s that are in this space. So, roughly, what we have in zk sync is we have zk zk VM. So this is today it's not fully EVM compatible. That's what we're working on. There are some some still like caveats in there, but it is still based on Solidity. So you can write a normal Solidity code compile with our compiler, mm -hmm. and then get, get this deployed. Mm -hmm. uh, we are, again, there are some competitors that are using directly EVM, whatnot. It's usually a trade-off between performance, yep. like proof performance, and you know, the, the compatibility yep. thing. Yep. Right. Um, right. So, uh, 
It's, it's, uh, sorry to interrupt. I think it's not just about compatibility, right? Because I believe this step here today is not proved, right? Like basically, it's like you you have compiler that is open source and people can verify or like people can look at what did the code actually does. But I I don't believe this transformation is there's like some kind of like verification that shows that it actually does what. No, but yeah. So, so this part is done by the user, right? Right. We right. as a system, we we don't do compilation on our side. We just get the bytecode. Right. 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 Yeah. So basically, you're. Trusting, or so if, if the compiler has some bug that may like not yes. be like uh, compared to like if you just directly deploy, um, uh, or I guess there are people still trusting the authority so to the even bytecode compiler. Yeah, yeah. Right? I guess so, that's, so the, that's, yeah, this is the compiler, <laughs> and yes, we are aware that this is kind of an additional risk factor, right? The yeah. same way how Sol C is a risk factor for yeah, like, yeah, everybody yeah. doing the yeah, yeah. yeah, that's something good. Uh, <laughs> okay, Before we go deeper, I would say that's that's a that, that's Okay, right. So this actually allows us to have a little bit different assembly that is more ZK, uh, ZK friendly. Yeah. Uh, right. Now, when we talk about, okay, but before we go deeper, questions, Bowen? Uh, yeah, maybe like, uh, I think the, you have different opcodes, right? Maybe like, I, I don't know whether you're like familiar with all the <laughs> differences in opcodes, but maybe like if there's some like important ones that you want to highlight uh, in terms of like, what are the, I think uh, I think like ZK Things VM support fewer op or like maybe there are some different opcodes that you support. Yeah, so I don't remember the exact details, okay. but from okay. what I do remember is that some of the opcodes in EVM are very ZK uh, unfriendly, okay. partially yeah. because we do have like in ZK VM we have like one circuit yeah, 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 that's yeah. handling most of the opcodes. Mm -hmm. I think almost all of them, and the moment. If we wanted to do like EVM opcodes directly, yep. the circuit would have been a lot larger because it has to handle like the largest possible inputs, yep. and that makes it in. How, how, does, how do you handle cache like this? Hashing function is usually one of the most difficult. <laughs> <laughs> so like uh, on, on Ethereum, cache hack is an opcode. Yep. But uh, for instance, things like SHA are uh, done via precompiles. Mm -hmm. And uh, basically, in ZK Sync, we have both cache hack and SHA mm -hmm. done as precompiles. Okay. So whenever users do a cache hack, instead of running just an opcode, there is actually a call done to the precompile. It receives the pre image. In, in I see. So it's like a, a like handwritten, very optimized like circuit. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pretty much. This is actually one of the benefits of the compiler. It allows you to do things, things like this. Right, right, right. Yeah. Um, and uh, maybe like talking a bit about the ZK part, right? Like what, what proving system is uh, ZK Sync using today? Magic. Okay. <laughs> no, it's, it's all a, magic. It's, it's all magic. It's all black magic. If you're really following this video right now, I mean, take a pause, breathe in, breathe out. It's just <laughs> going to go crazy. And, and, you know, honestly, there are plenty of videos out there that focus just on the proving system. So here we'll just touch like bits and pieces. But roughly, up to right now, we're using a snark-based system oh, okay. with a bunch of changes because people are calling it snarks, but there are of course devils in the details. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like, how do you do copy constraints and gates, whatnot? And here we have a whole crypto team, and I would suggest a completely separate, <laughs> very deep dive uh, to explain how they differ. Yeah. From my perspective, it's a snark system with KZG commitments okay, on L1. Right. So we use the KZG. We use snark. at the same time, literally today, if you're watching this, you try it out. We announced Bojum. Bojum. How do you say it? Bojum. Bojum. We announced. Uh, no idea. Uh, okay, we should edit this out. <laughs> so we announced Bojum, uh, which is a new proof system that we're rolling out that is more Stark based Stark -based, okay. with Fry Verifier. Okay, Fry. The main trade offs in there is the old proof system. It's run on GPUs, but it requires around 80 gigs mm -hmm. of GPU RAM mm -hmm. in order to run it. This means that if you really want to run it, you need to get the A100s or whatever is the top GPU that you can get. And with the current AI boom, they are <laughs> <They're> <laughs> tricky to get, let's say. It's not even about expensive, they are not there. Oh, that's, that's um, the new proof system with Starks allows us to kind of optimize it down to, I think, 16, 10, 12 gigs oh, okay. of RAM, um, which suddenly allows you to run it on the like, regular GPUs. Okay, right? okay. But of course, this being a Stark, uh, there are some trade-offs. Yeah, in there, sure. especially on the proof size yeah. and, on the ver and on the verification time, yeah. verification yeah. gas. So we do have some optimization that we're working on right now yeah. in order to wrap this final proof. Right. And kind of still do the KZG, but like plonk KZG, but only for the last part. Only for the last part. So okay, the, way, the okay. way to think about it is like you prove the whole so thing. So it's like a kind of Nova style, like, where like you, you do like 
It's like a patch thing and then like a... And then like the proving... Then the, the proving you, at the end. Pro yes, so it's like you, you prove the proving yeah, 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 using yeah, a different thing yeah, that yeah. allows you to stay with like KZG, which is so much more oh, but, but like, uh, th yeah, that's interesting because like the one, one disadvantage with KZG is that you need to do trusted setup, right? So like I saw like by moving to Stark, you're trying to like essentially like remove that like trusses or like is that not a concern for legacy? That's an additional bonus. <laughs> but I mean, it's uh, it's one of the future proof concerns, but it's not like a major concern because, for instance, dunk sharding, mm -hmm. it's also done with KGD and trusted setup. So I mean, and uh, also like ECD, like ECDSA and most of the signatures which are used in Ethereum. I'm not sure about other blockchains, but uh, like they are non-quantum secure. Right. So like since we derive security from layer one, like <laughs> it's, it's, it doesn't matter too much right now. Yeah. Right. To set up because you have a like one sequencer doesn't really matter right now. I mean, just remember this is like a universal trust setup. Yeah, yeah, like universal trust. Like yeah, you yeah. don't have to create like yeah, a trust yeah. per circuit, like in graph. It's like just yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, okay, that makes sense. Um, but yeah, I think um, yeah, my understanding is that Snark. Yeah, as you said, the one of the advantages of Snark is that the proof size is quite small. Uh, like, that, how does that um, or like does that have any effect on like? Uh, they can think by switching to to like a stark based model, right? with larger proof size and yeah, so so, so like that, maybe cost more gas or like so. exactly. So this is part, this is the thing that we're doing right now. So we're still experimenting with a bunch of approaches, but on one side, starks do allow us to proof a lot more blocks. Mm -hmm. right? So the idea is that with stark we would kind of try to prove multiple blocks or like multiple L1 batches kind of doing the recurs recursive proofs, but not, which will allow us to amortize the cost. Mm -hmm. But again, this is still in the middle of like testing and gas optimizations, whatnot. So, you know, stay tuned and we'll, 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 we'll see how it goes. Okay. And maybe let's talk a bit about like how the proving system like integrate into the like uh, uh, L2 itself, right? There's this, uh, uh, like from basically from like a protocol protocol point of view, like how does the proof generation work with the um, like the block production and and so on? You can generally consider proof production as a black box because there is, for instance, a lot of motion like uh, in the space to create some maybe decentralized markets for proving, etc. Because like if, if if proving becomes centralized, actually it's just like another point of centralization, and uh, yeah. But right now. How it generally works is that once we have a block, we firstly publish a state on layer one, and then we, on our servers, we start generating the proof. Mm -hmm. And once the proof is generated, we just submit the proof to layer one, mm -hmm. and layer one verifies that the proof is correct. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's it. Yeah. So, so if we want to go a little bit deeper with this, yeah. the, way, the way to think about it is like this. If you imagine you have like a sequencer here. Mm -hmm. So sequencer keeps receiving the L2 transactions. And it's trying to put them in a batch. Mm -hmm. So we actually have a bunch of criterion of when do we decide that the batch is full. One of them is some arbitrary thing, like, okay, 1,000 transactions, like mm -hmm. some kind of thing that we have. The other ones might be time-related. The other ones are actually the pub, pub data related. For example, we want to make sure that, you know, the amount of pub data doesn't exceed the Ethereum limits, whatnot, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Actually, on, on that specific topic, like, how do you determine the size so that you know, for example, the proof generation doesn't take like forever, or like, it, like a, is there like a concept of some kind of like gas that you like kind of use as thresholder? Yeah, so, so the good news about our proof system is we are not really limited by the gas, okay. but there are some operations that we're kind of, we're, we're optimizing. For example, amount of catch Right, right, yeah, if like I have like a thousand catch here, like. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, so kind of each, so the, the way you think you can think about it is like we're doing a box, n-dimensional box packing. Right, and if one dimension kind of exceeds the limit, then we have to like stop the ah, okay. Just okay. stop the batch. I see. Yes. But here, in case of sequencer, we're doing we, we can do like try to see if it fits, and if not, we we can pull it out. Okay. So kind of we do a bunch of like, okay, does it fit? No, this one doesn't fit. Okay, but, let's put something else. Inside. Yeah, but but I understand that. But like, wouldn't it cause some like transaction to randomly fail from like from like user point of view? It doesn't understand like why it just fail, but then transaction after it succeeds. For example, like you, you have like this transaction that got taken out, but then like um, I don't know like a transaction which like a uh, I don't know how the nouns works here, but like some other transaction invited that transaction got got like. No, no, no. So so he, 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 here the way the way to think about it is like when we see that something is sticking out, we're just gonna close the block. 
Okay. And we're gonna put this in the next one. So it's not gonna fail from user perspective. Okay, okay. Like so it's gonna guarantee not to, not to fail. Yeah, okay. okay. I mean, there are plenty of cases where <laughs> transactions would fail, but this, this will okay. not be one of those. Right? Okay, okay, okay. But the Makes idea sense. is this, you know, the sequencer are kind of trying to grow the block, and then it's, you know, it's ready. Yeah. And the L2 block is ready. And then as Tash mentioned, we do publish it to L1. Mm. as like, hey, heads up, there's like this block coming. Mm. And then what's happening separately you think about it as, as a complete separate pro process, is doing the proving. Mm -hmm. Now, prover is actually kind of taking these existing blocks that it kind of hopes that they will be like correct and doing the whole so-called witness and, and proof generation. Because mm -hmm. the way to kind of we have to see how, how deep we can go with this, but um, <laughs> You know, normally the, the way you think about a function is like, okay, get a function with some inputs and it produces some outputs. Right? In case of a prover, it's more like, you know, the function gets all the inputs and it kind of succeeds or fails. So like everything is given there. Mm -hmm. uh, with the example of like, let's say in the function you're reading, like here, you're reading some value from some memory cell. Here for the prover, what will happen as the input, it will not be just this value from the memory cell. We're gonna provide like, hey, the whole Merkle path mm -hmm. in this. So a yep. simple operation of like, you know, read, or even simpler, equals free, mm -hmm. right? Will be, you know, in normal executions, like, okay, put right, 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 this right. there. In case of prover, it will be like, hey, can you check yeah. that if the previous state was yeah. this, and you executed this, yeah. then the next state is this. Yeah. Is this whole thing like right. true? Yeah. Right? So that's kind of what prover is. Prov you can think about prover like doing like asserts kind yeah, of yeah, yeah, yeah. along the way. Yeah. So this means that the prover is actually split into two pieces. Excellent. One of them is called witness generation, and this is the heavy part. Because this is the part that takes each of these operations mm -hmm. and kind of blow them up. I mean like, okay, this is actually like this path on the Merkle tree, and this, we're adding this here, and this is the path of the Merkle tree after right, we right. finish the execution. And witness can get like gigabytes, many mm -hmm. gigabytes inside. And then this get passed, and that's where the magic happens uh, with like polynomial oh. writing, whatnot. And this gets passed to, to the actual GPU part. It's doing the evaluation. But like, couldn't you split into two parts where like one is like pretty, purely proving the state, the other is proving the computation, and like you like somehow aggregate it at the end, or like you, um, like basically like the, the compute part assumes all the state is correct, and you just like runs through and, and can just like check all the computation, then you have a separate thing that like checks the, all the state is correct. That's actually very similar how our, our prover works, okay. like uh, yeah, so we have you know, like the main circuits, which respond, which are responsible for computation, like we call them main, and they like they're responsible for add, move, you know, like most of the computation, mm -hmm. not for cache acts, uh, but, <laughs> but uh, yeah. And, and we have a bunch of like different other things, like uh, you know, like memory manager, like etc. And uh, then uh, like uh, all these things, like for instance, you know, like this main computation, whenever it does some memory law, you know, like it, it reads some unit of memory, it just blindly trusts that, I hope this value is correct, yeah, it just, and then, like, we just store, for instance, somewhere here, like, some commitment to all the memory, include them as possible, but anyway, it's like a commitment for all the memory, and then, you know, like, this memory circuit, it would prove that, okay, under some commitment, this memory is correct, it also remembers that there is some commitment, and then uh, during the final aggregation phase, mm -hmm. in the end, it's just all proven that, okay, like all the commitments are right. Uh, yeah, so like, uh, and the same for storage, the same for catch acts and a lot of other like, things which we need to optimize. Yeah. So if we go that deep, there are actually like 13 of these. <laughs> right? So there are like 13 different circuits that are responsible for different parts about like storage writing, storage reading, then like aggregations, leaf notes, scheduler, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a bunch of exciting uh, complexity hidden in there. And then with the witness generation, is that also done in parallel? Like, is that also parallelized or is it? Like yeah, so this is like, yeah, here I very much simplified okay. that. But okay. the idea is like, yes, we are actually doing, let's say that this, this thing is doing witness generation for the main VM, for, for this main circuit and this. And then we do for, for, for the like larger leaves, larger and larger. 
Okay, so. okay. <laughs> it sounds very complex. Yeah, so it's like a multi, multi-step process in there, yes. Okay, okay. Um, and then I guess your question regarding like this, uh, maybe the posting proofs on L1, like how does, um, like let's say the Ethereum itself is getting, is getting contrasted, right? How, how would that affect uh, ZK Sync? It does affect us in the sense that uh, users, they have to pay for the proving, they have to pay for the data published. So there are things which we do, like we, uh, on one hand, we try to have lower gas price for the users. So we, you know, like there is a small congestion, we, we might just wait. But uh, on the other hand, we want the finality to be in reasonable time mm -hmm. and we want proofs to be published in reasonable time. Mm -hmm. So in this case, well, uh, like for this block in particular, we'll have to take a loss, but in the next block, we'll raise the gas price mm -hmm. for, the, like, for the current levels so that, you know, we get compensated. And on average, we're com co we are compensated. So. I see. Yeah, actually on that topic, maybe can you talk a bit about the L2, like gas, how do you charge like transactions? And right, so basically if you think about the L2 gas price, there is a dependency on L1, mm -hmm. right? We do publish data to L1, which means we have to somehow show this cost in there. Right. The way we, we do this is on one side, we do have a thing that's called like, uh, so we, we do have an L2 gas price, mm -hmm. that's like separate from L1, but the the operations that require writing to L1 mm -hmm. do have a variable cost. Mm -hmm. okay. So the way you, you can think about it is if L1 gas price is, let's say, 1,000, whatever, and L2 gas price is, you know, 5, mm -hmm. then let's say doing a write, that sorry, doing an operation uh, that requires you to write to yeah. L1 might cost you yeah, today, yeah, 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 might yeah, yeah. cost you like 200. Right, right. And then maybe tomorrow it will cost 400. Right, right. So this does vary. Right, right. right. And, and that's mostly the cost of posting as call data to, to L1. Yeah, most of the cost is posting the call data, but also cost of pro proving it also is... Oh, of proving. Yeah, it's, the yeah. proof itself ha also has to end up like on the on layer, on, yeah. on layer one, right? right. So kind of, you can think about like each L1 batch that we put on layer one is gonna cost us some pub data mm -hmm. that people, that kind of depends on transactions, plus these many bytes on this much L, this much L1 gas to do the actual, even the actual KZG uh -huh. thing in the... KZG Right, right. And, and is that like an expense, how expensive is that in terms of, like is it, I guess maybe I, that's I, not a meaningful question, but is it all yeah. relative? So <laughs> like uh, on one hand, it is a constant cost, or, or like uh, with uh, KZG, like with general like uh, KZG based systems, it's a constant cost. Mm -hmm. So like if we had like infinite amount of transactions, it it would call it we we, we could call it negligible. Uh, uh, yeah, but uh, right now, like exactly right now, in the future, I think we will ag aggregate more blocks for one proof. But uh, right now, we have one batch and uh, one proof, and because of that, I would say that an average cost for you know like various overhead from block, like for verification, other things, it's like one third or maybe one fourth of, of a price of a badge. So, oh, it's, okay. it's, 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 so it is a lot less than state divs, but not negligible yet. I see, I see. But in the long run, it is negligible. Which actually brings us to an interesting topic because, you know, we do, we do publish state divs today because we were like fully an L2 rollup. But the thing that we were working on is something what Stash hinted at the beginning was the thing that we're calling ZK Porter because the question might be like, hey, what if I don't need to publish my state mm -hmm. to L1? What if I'm fine with taking some risk? Because yep. again, the risk here is, you know, the, the Matter Labs database like disappearing yep. and you're not being able to like recover your state. But I'm willing to take this risk because let's mm -hmm. say I have some less valuable things right. and then I can save on all the like pub data costs. Mm -hmm. right? So this is something what we call ZK Porter or Validium, right? right? Yeah. And if you, kind of look at the example that Stash mentioned at the beginning with like our state. Mm -hmm. There's like this shard that we published to the, this is the roll ah. right? And then here is this shard that would be a ZK Porter that would not be published. So the idea being that if you inter if you kind of decide explicitly like, okay, my contract is some low value NFT. I don't mind about like this state disappearing if something goes bad, but I really want to cut my costs then suddenly you can kind of deploy your account here. Right. The cool thing about this model is like, these are still synchronous calls. So like you mm -hmm. still yeah. interact with this the way you would normally do, but all the state changes here would not be published over. Mm -hmm. right. So you will not be able to recover this state from, from, from the old one. Yeah. 
And then is there like, yeah, since we're talking about like this uh, Viridium or like, hi, I think they get thing called hi, hyperscaling. Or, Are we going to talk about that too? Uh, just yeah. in two seconds, okay. amazing. Okay, okay. but, but like, uh, because the question here is like, yeah, uh, is, is there like a third assumption, which is that uh, I still somewhat care about my scarcity of my, like, or the availability of my data, but maybe like, I don't want to pay as high of a cost. Let's say I want to use like a separate data availability solution. I don't post on Ethereum, I post like somewhere else, like like near, for example. Like, is it like a like is it a thing that that they can think is thinking about? I would say there are two like options here. First one is for Ziki Porter. Our end goal is to not rely only on Metro Labs. There will be like obviously some decentralization in this in in this regard, like. Uh, Almost in all validiums, they're always you know like not one, one party that stores the data because just losing one database is too easy. Like <laughs> at least ten, you know, at least ten parties usually store. Like maybe less, but depends. That's one thing. And uh, I would say that's already good enough for a lot of people. But if someone wants to design their own data availability solution, they can do it. But uh, you know, each case needs to be designed separately. So I would say they they have to. In theory, it's possible because zero knowledge proofs, they give you validity of computation. Mm -hmm. And how you publish data, well, it's up to the designer. So maybe someone can deploy an L3 on ZK Sync. Maybe they can deploy an L2 using ZK Stack. And that's like the, uh, our f f future tooling to help develop rollups. And uh, yeah, so that will be the choice of everyone. Because you touched on a very good point. Is this is what we're announcing right now, mm -hmm. is the ZK stack. Mm -hmm. The ability to take the ZK technology, this is the whole thing that's open source, we're actually making it easier for people to run, and allow you to go ahead and you know, deploy your own, your own chain separately. Right? Your own chain, and then you can choose a different data availability layer, if you want to, near something else, Filecoin or whatnot. And the really cool thing and so now we're going to go more into scaling and hyperbridges. The really cool thing about if you're running the ZK stack and you're using the same ZK EVM, the same proofs, it allows everybody else to verify your proof, without, like to verify your, your state and computation very efficiently, very quickly. Mm -hmm. right? So this allows the, the hyperscaling, the hyperbridges. Because what, what it means is that you know you don't need, because in, in case of optimistic rollups, you have to like replay all the transactions to make sure that you're up to date, whatnot. In this case, you don't. Because you know, you, you know the circuits, you can verify them very quickly, and you know this is the right state. Mm -hmm. So this is another thing that we're announcing, the, the hyperscaling, the hyper bridges, whatnot. This means that multiple ZK stack deployed chains, or subchains, whatever you want to call it, they can operate between each other mm -hmm. very efficiently. And we're, and you know, here I'll, I'll send people to the, the Medium post that we're posting right now for all the details. But the idea being that this allows them to kind of share multiple bridges, mm -hmm. right? And again, a great interop interoperability between them. Mm -hmm. and actually, yeah, the, the, that reminds me of a question, like the proof, is the proof like recursive? Is it like proving like everything up to like this point or is it only proving the, like the past, like since last, last block? So today our proofs are not recursive. I mean, we are just proving the state, and you can think about state transition from X to Y. Uh, but yes, in, in theory, you could, especially with the star based proofs, you, you could do yeah, recursive. Yeah. You could. yeah, because if you don't recurse, then you cannot just like, you, in order to verify, you still need to verify all the, all the proofs. Right? Yes, like, yes, but it's exactly why I'm talking that this, that's why this requires like the Stark approach. It actually does, does allow you to do recursive. Yeah, 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 okay. Yeah, so yeah, if you only need to validate to like one proof, yeah, that, that would be very cool. Um, okay, um, I think we're kind of running out of time. Uh, how much time do we have left? Okay, yeah, roughly the time. Um, so yeah, anything else that uh, uh, Marcin or Stas want to, to add about uh, the awesome technology that uh, they can think has developed? I would say just come to our website and uh, try out ZK Sync, read about ZK Stack, and uh, yeah. yeah. One one thing I would say is that really the as I mentioned earlier, the ZK looks like magic, and it is magic. You're gonna read it once, twice, five times, and then after the twentieth time, you'll we'll be like, oh, that's how it works. We actually encourage you to take a look, and again, don't give up. <laughs> really, don't give up. 
uh, because at the end, this is like one of the most exciting technologies, uh, like of the of the current of the current blockchain. Yep. Yep. Yeah. It's so. the the future. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, thanks a lot, Martin and uh, Stats, for uh, walking me through uh, the uh, how the casing works. Um, and yes, yeah, thanks again um, for coming. And we will post the uh, uh, links in the in the show notes. Yeah.